Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing tertiary lymphoid organogenesis. Okay, so we've discussed now that tertiary lymphoid organogenesis is the process whereby you build up uh, masses of naive uh, T cells and naive B cells at a site where you have had a chronic inflammatory response. Okay, and the reason that this happens is that the post capillary venules in this chronically inflamed site will undergo a change basically, where they change from looking like this to looking like this. They become high endothelial venules, basically, or at least similar to the high endothelial venules. The name high endothelial venules is generally saved for these venules that are within lymph nodes. But these endothelial cells certainly become high endothelial cells, okay? Uh, so, um, this then leads to uh, naive T cells and naive B cells that are circulating within the blood uh, they're going to now be recruited by this uh, high endothelial venule-like venule, um, and they'll be moved into this site of chronic inflammation, and you therefore get a build-up of these naive T cells and naive B cells. Now, they can leave, they can go back into the bloodstream across this uh, modified venule, but basically they become like a secondary lymphoid organ, and that's what is meant by a tertiary lymphoid organ. Okay, so we want to discuss how um, how do you induce these endothelial cells to undergo this change where they become these high endothelial cells, and how do they recruit these naive T cells and naive B cells? Okay, so basically this change in the endothelial cells is going to be induced by uh, the presence of lymphocytes in the interstitial fluid, okay? So we've discussed that as part of the adaptive immune response, you are bringing in T helper 1 cells, cytotoxic T cells, and T helper 2 cells into the um, interstitial fluid, basically, okay? Now, on the surface of these T cells, you have a molecule known as lymphotoxin beta, Okay, so let's say this is our T cell, and I'll correct the fact that I haven't actually managed to join those two lines together by encirculating it in pink. There we go. So let's say this is our T lymphocyte. So it's either a T helper 1 cell, cytotoxic T lymphocyte, or a T helper 2 cell. The point is that it's not a naive T cell. You haven't brought naive T cells in yet. You have to undergo this transformation in the endothelium in order to bring in naive T cells. Okay, so this T lymphocyte will have on its surface a, a molecule or a protein known as lymphotoxin uh, beta. Okay, so this is a lymphotoxin beta, and for short, people abbreviate lymphotoxin beta to LT beta. Now, do not confuse this for a leukotriene, because LT often stands for leukotriene, especially when we're talking about um, the immune system and inflammation, but it's not uh, leukotriene. It's uh, lymphotoxin beta. Okay, now, Lymphotoxin beta has a receptor on the surface of the endothelial cells. So, let's say we have our endothelial cell that at the moment is normal, but is about to undergo this transformation. Basically, the endothelial cell has a receptor for lymphotoxin beta, and this is known as the lymphotoxin beta receptor. So, a nice, sensible name, nice and easy to remember. Lympho toxin beta receptor, okay? And for short, lymphotoxin beta receptors are often abbreviated to LTBRs, or really we should try and put a beta there, so this is a beta rather than a B, LT beta Rs. Okay, right, so now what we want to look at is what signaling pathways does this lymphotoxin beta receptor actually induce within the endothelial cell? Okay, because those are going to lead to the transformation of this endothelial cell into the high endothelial uh, cell type. Okay, right. So, 
uh, let's begin this process. So, there are two pathways which this lymphotoxin beta receptor is going to activate once lymphotoxin beta has bound to it. Okay, now one is known as the canonical NF-kappa B pathway, and the other is known as the non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway. So we're going to activate the canonical um, NF-kappa B pathway, and basically what you have to understand is that NF-kappa B is not just one type of a transcription factor. There are loads of uh, transcription factors which are all grouped together as being NF-kappa Bs. So, in the canonical NF-kappa B pathway, you activate the normal NF-kappa B. Okay, so there is an NF-kappa B transcription factor uh, which is the most common one to uh, be involved in pathways, and that's the one that you're going to activate in the canonical NF-kappa B pathway. And don't worry, we will go through all of this. Okay, and you're also going to activate a non-canonical or an alternative NF-kappa B pathway, and this is going to activate a different NF-kappa B Okay, and it's a less common one, it's a more niche one. Right, and the canonical NF-kappa B pathway is not actually going to lead to this transformation in uh, the endothelial cell to a high endothelial uh, cell. Instead, it's going to cause type 2 activation of the endothelial cell, which we'll go through um, later. Okay, whereas the non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway is the one which is actually going to lead to uh, this transformation. So we'll start off with the canonical NF-kappa B pathway. Okay, so the first thing that happens is the lymphotoxin beta receptor is going to activate two kinases. Okay, so let's just copy this out. So we've got our phospholipid bi there of our endothelial cell here. And in that phospholipid bi there, here we have the lymphotoxin beta receptor. So this is the lymphotoxin beta receptor, which I'll abbreviate to LT beta R, like that. And the lymphotoxin has now bound to it, which will be attached to the membrane of some T cell over here, some T lymphocyte. Okay, so here's the lymphotoxin in the membrane of the T cell. Okay, so I'll label that up as well. So, lymphotoxin beta, LT beta. Right, so now what's going to happen is that the uh, lymphotoxin beta receptor is going to activate two kinase enzymes. Now, one of these is known as the MEC3 kinase. Okay, so let me show this. Okay, so one of these enzymes you are going to activate is going to be called MEKK3. Okay, so let me show this. So, MEKK3. Now, what does MEKK3 stand for? Well, this is complicated. And also, the, the things that are involved in this name are nothing to do with the pathway we're going to discuss, which is why it's even more complicated. So it stands for MAP-K, which means MAP kinase, slash ERK. So the MAP-K, this name gives you the M there, the ERK gives you the E, and then the other two Ks stand for kinase kinase. Okay, so you might wonder, well, what on earth? Why have you put two kinases there? Well, it's because this enzyme is going to phosphorylate and activate a MAPK ERK kinase. So it is the kinase enzyme for a MAPK ERK kinase, and that's why it's called that. And the MAPK ERK kinases are kinases for the MAPK ERKs, and those are actually kinases. So you often might also hear this referred to as a MAPKKK, okay, like that, because it's MAP kinase kinase kinase. So it is a MAP kinase 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 enzyme. 
Okay, but as I say, we're not actually going to discuss map kinase or ERK enzymes at all. And map kinase is another name for an ERK. Um, so we won't dwell on uh, that being what the MEC3 actually stands for. Okay, so basically the uh, lymphotoxin beta receptor is going to activate this MEC3 enzyme. It's also going to activate another kinase enzyme, which we'll put down here, okay? And this enzyme is known as transforming growth factor beta um, activated kinase 1, okay? So, uh, this is transforming growth factor beta, which will often be abbreviated just to TGF beta, and then activated kinase, okay? And it's the TGF beta activated kinase 1. Okay, so this is often abbreviated to TAC1 for short. So T from TGF, A from activated, K from kinase 1. So let me just write out what TGF beta stands for so that the discussion is complete, the name is complete. This stands for transforming growth factor beta. Okay. Right, so, uh, and transforming growth factor beta is actually growth inhibiting. It's a weird growth factor. Um, it um, produces cell cycle inhibitors, uh, which stop the progression through the cell cycle. Okay, so, um, this is the TGF beta activated kinase 1, but again, as far as we're concerned, it's this pathway we're going to look at is nothing to do with uh, TGF beta. Um, okay, so both of these kinases are going to be activated by uh, the lymphotoxin beta receptor when it has lymphotoxin beta bound to it. Okay, now both of these are going to do the same thing, so we're still looking at a single pathway here. Both of these are involved in the canonical NF-kappa-B pathway. We aren't looking at all yet at the non-canonical pathway. Okay, so what are they going to do? Well, they're basically going to phosphorylate a component of a complex. So let me show you this complex. Okay, so there is a complex which is going to be very important in this um, tertiary lymphoid organogenesis pathway, which is made up of three proteins. Okay, one of these is called IKK gamma. And don't worry, I'll tell you what the, it stands for in a moment. And then down here we have IKK alpha. Okay, and down here we have IKK beta. So it's nice and easy to remember. You have three of them, and they're all IKK. So what does IKK stand for? Well, if we take, for instance, IKK beta as the example, because this is the one that's going to be acted upon by uh, this MEC3 and this TAC1. Okay, it stands for I kappa B, which is a uh, protein known as inhibitor of kappa B, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and then kinase beta. Okay, so you take the I from inhibitor, and let me just write out what I kappa B means. It's the inhibitor of NF kappa B. Inhibitor of NF kappa B. Okay, also sometimes just referred to as inhibitor of kappa B. Okay, uh, so I for inhibitor, then you take the K for the kappa there, and then you take the K from the kinase, and then you've got beta. So that's the inhibitor of kappa B kinase beta, and you put a little dash there. Okay, right. So all the others, the IKK gamma is the inhibitor of kappa B um, kinase gamma, and IKK alpha is the inhibitor of kappa B kinase alpha. Right. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, these two enzymes that we've activated, these two kinase enzymes, this MEC3 and this TGF beta activated kinase 1, they are going to add a phosphate group onto the inhibitor of kappa B kinase beta here. Okay, so we're going to stick a phosphate group on here, and this activates the enzymic activity of this protein complex. Okay, so once we have um, activated this protein complex, what is it going to do? Well, basically, it's going to phosphorylate 
and inactivate the inhibitor of kappa B protein. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to phosphorylate and inactivate the inhibitor of kappa B protein. Now, to understand the significance of that, we need to understand what the inhibitor of kappa B does. So basically, here is an inhibitor of NF-kappa B protein. Okay, so here it is. And there's not just one of these, there are multiple different types, and we'll talk about uh, the types of inhibitor of NF-kappa B proteins that are specifically going to be targeted by this activated enzyme complex where you've got this phosphate group on IKK-beta, okay? Uh, but we'll do that in a moment. And, af and all the different types of inhibitors of NF-kappa Bs, they do the same thing, which is that they bind to an NF-kappa B transcription factor. Now, the NF-kappa B transcription factor that's going to be involved in this pathway is going to be the normal NF-kappa B uh, transcription factor, which consists of a dimer of two proteins. One is known as P65, and the other is known as P50. Okay, now both of these, confusingly, also have other names. So P50 is also often referred to as NF kappa B, and I actually haven't told you what NF kappa B stands for. It stands for nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so nuclear factor kappa B, and these sort of nuclear factors um, are extremely important in inducing inflammatory responses. Okay, nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, and this is nuclear factor kappa B protein 1. Okay, so NF kappa B1. Now, nuclear factor kappa B, if you just say nuclear factor kappa B, then usually what people will mean by nuclear factor kappa B is this dimer, both of them together. However, there are more than one nuclear factor of kappa B, as we'll see. We're going to see another one in a moment when we look at the non-canonical pathway, okay? But this is the normal NF-kappa B, this dimer of P65 with P50, okay? And it's made up of these two proteins, P65 and P50, and P50 is also called NF-kappa B1. Okay, and um, I should also mention that P65 also has another name, so it's also referred to as REL A. Okay, so both of these also have other names, and you may well hear them referred to as REL A and NF kappa B1, but I would say P65 and P50 are more pervasive. Okay, now, this dimer of P65 and P50, this will go into the nucleus and activate the transcription of certain genes if only it was released from the claws of this inhibitor of NF-kappa B protein here. Okay, so the inhibitor of kappa B protein keeps the NF-kappa B, this dimer of P65 and P50, firmly in the cytoplasm. Now, if you break this inhibitor of kappa B off from the P65 and the P50, then it will stop um, the inhibitor of kappa B from uh, being able to prevent the NF-kappa B from going into the nucleus. The NF-kappa B will then go into the nucleus and um, activate transcription of a bunch of genes which are going to cause type 1 activation. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.